Hello everyone, my name is Rebecca and welcome back to... Okay, I gotta take this thing off, it doesn't feel right. <laughs> It's like it's an actual show or something. So after my week off, I'm all rested up and ready to take on the world. So I'm coming back strong with an episode on Molly Hooper and how she supports TJLC. Let's just get this out of the way. Yes, this video will discuss why Sherlali doesn't work narratively, because that's kind of unavoidable with this topic. My main focus here is to show how Molly, like every other character and plot line on the show, supports the romantic relationship between John and Sherlock. That's the reason why it would never work out between her and Sherlock. That's not why she was included. And I think that's a good thing. Female characters can exist for other reasons other than to end up with the main male lead. And the show has told us that Molly's happy ending would involve her finding her courage and moving on from Sherlock. If you didn't already know, unlike most of the recurring characters on the show, there is no Molly Hooper equivalent in the canon. Since creating characters isn't something that the writers do often, we should understand why they made her. In the pilot version of the show, the intent was just to include her in one scene. I would say the one that took us by surprise and sort of leapt up was Molly Hooper played by Lou Brilly, who was really a one-shot deal in the, in the pilot. Just, a, just a, a device to indicate that Sherlock Holmes has no real interest in women. So on a symbolic level, that's Molly's primary purpose, to demonstrate Sherlock's lack of attraction to women. But when they reshot the series, they ended up using Molly more often. Part of that was probably because they really liked Lou's performance and wanted to see more of her. That also gave the writers the opportunity to do something new with Molly symbolically. Since their intent was to handle the romance more delicately in the series, they needed to find more nuanced forms of subtext. That's where Molly came back in. And Molly was never intended to be a continuing character. She was literally intended for that one scene that was to establish Sherlock not even noticing that this girl was in love with him. He wasn't even being cruel to her, he just didn't notice. It was so much more complicated and powerful that we ended up using her a lot. What's complicated and powerful about her continued presence in the series is that the writers chose to not only continue to use her as a clue that Sherlock isn't attracted to women, but to also use her to mirror John's feelings for Sherlock. The writers did this because they knew that for most of the audience, it would be much easier to see a woman's attraction to Sherlock than a man's. So they have Molly there as a way to decode John's attraction to Sherlock. They draw attention to the mirror by having both John and Molly dress similarly, having them say the same line or having the same line said about both of them. It wasn't working for me. It wasn't working for me. And domestic dress must suit you, Molly. You've put on three pounds since I last saw you. Put on seven pounds since you got married and the cycling isn't doing it. Well, I'm... moving on. Yeah. But we've done. And having them act in similar ways. So she's alive then. How are we feeling about that? Whose phone is it? A woman's. Your girlfriend. Stop it. <sighs> Just... Stop it. No, we're not playing this game. All of these techniques are used throughout the series and even in some of the supplementary materials. Let's start with the blogs as an example. I've gotten some questions about this in the past so I thought I should clear it up. All the blog posts are officially written by people involved with the show and approved of by the showrunners. And the complete list of websites can be found here. One of the three characters to get their own blog is Molly Hooper. It would be a strange choice to create an entire website for a character who gets at most 10 minutes of screen time in a given episode, but they use the blogs to draw a parallel between John and Molly. Before meeting Sherlock, both characters start up blogs where they talk about how lonely they are. Hi, my name is Molly Hooper. I work at Bart's Hospital. I'm 31. Sorry, this is sounding like a list. I'm not sure why I'm doing this. It's just nice to have someone to talk to. <laughs> that makes me sound so lonely. I meant it's nice to have somewhere I can share my feelings. Pointless. Nothing happens to me. There's been another one of those serial suicides. It's weird. There doesn't seem to be any connection between the deceased. It doesn't make sense. Met up with Bill Murray, not the film star. He was the nurse who saved my life when I was shot. He's got married. Stuff's happening to other people. Then they both meet Sherlock. Molly meets him the day before John, and their tone totally changes. It's astonishing how similar these entries are. 29th of January. A strange meeting. I don't know how I meant to be writing this. I'm not a writer. Ella thought keeping a blog would help, but it hasn't because nothing ever happens to me. But today, something did. Something happened. I was walking in the park and I bumped into Mike Stamford. We were sort of mates when we were students. We got coffee and I mentioned that I wanted to move. He said he knew of someone in a similar situation, so we went to Bart's and he introduced us. Except he didn't. He didn't introduce us. The man knew who I was. 
Somehow, he knew everything about me. He knew I'd served in Afghanistan, and he knew I'd been invalided. He said my wound was psychosomatic, so he didn't get everything right. But he even knew why I was there, despite the fact that Mike hadn't told him. So I googled him when I got back to the flat and found a link to his website, The Science of Deduction. It's mad. I think he might be mad. He was certainly arrogant and really quite rude, and he looks about 12, and he's clearly a bit public school, and yes, I definitely think he might be mad. But he was also strangely likable. He was charming. It really was all just a bit strange. So tomorrow we're off to look at a flat. Me and the madman. Me and Sherlock Holmes. 28th of January. Do you believe in love at first sight? There's this man, and I love him. At least, I think I do. I can't stop thinking about him. He's so intelligent, it's like he's burning. And he's so cool, but not really. And he's fit. Oh, he's really fit. And I can't stop thinking about him. I'm a sensible girl. I always have been. I worked hard to get the job I have, and I've got plans, but he just rides all over everything. It's like I'm Molly Hooper, in control, little Miss Perfect, as my mates call me, until he walks into the room, and then suddenly I'm this little mouse. He turns me into a mouse. Squeak, squeak. They get away with it because most people won't know to check for Molly's blog, but it's right there to tell us how John is really feeling. The day John meets Sherlock, Molly writes again saying how bad she feels around Sherlock. She says the way she acts around him isn't normal for her, that he makes her feel helpless and small, like a mouse. That really isn't a healthy feeling and it really shouldn't be interpreted romantically. So it's already clear that a relationship with Sherlock isn't what's best for Molly. She also recognizes that he isn't interested in her, and we can see that for ourselves on the show. Listen, I was wondering, Maybe later, when you're finished. You're wearing lipstick. You weren't wearing lipstick before. I, uh... I refreshed it a bit. Sorry, you were saying? I was wondering if you'd like to have coffee. Black, two sugars, please. I'll be upstairs. Okay. Ah, Molly, coffee, thank you. What happened to the lipstick? It wasn't working for me. Really? I thought it was a big improvement. Mouth's too small now. Okay. Again, Sherlock isn't interested in Molly and rudely dismisses her, but he turns on the charm with John to capture his interest. Is that it? Is that what? We've only just met, and we're gonna go look at a flat. Problem? We don't know a thing about each other. I don't know where we're meeting. I don't even know your name. I know you're an army doctor and you've been invalided home from Afghanistan. I know you've got a brother who's worried about you, but you won't go to him for help because you don't approve of him, possibly because he's an alcoholic, more likely because he recently walked out on his wife. And I know that your therapist thinks your limp psychosomatic quite correctly, I'm afraid. It's enough to be going on with, don't you think? The name's Sherlock Holmes, and the address is 221B Baker Street. There is a clear distinction there, and we know from John's blog that it worked. Like Stephen said in the interview, Sherlock isn't ignoring Molly to be cruel, but because he genuinely doesn't know how to navigate that situation. There's also a clear difference between Molly trying to find an excuse to talk to Sherlock again, and being totally ignored on her second day knowing Sherlock, and John in his first meeting with Sherlock being asked to meet with him the next day, going with him to look at a prospective flat share, being asked by Sherlock to join him on cases, and being invited by Sherlock to go to dinner with him at the end of the episode. And like I've said before, Sherlock makes no attempt to soften his rejection of Molly, but when John asks him out, he's sure to mention that he's flattered. Do you have a boyfriend? Which is fine, by the way. I know it's fine. So you've got a boyfriend? No. Right. Okay. <laughs> You're unattached. It's like me. Fine. Right. <clears throat> Good. John, um, I think you should know that I consider myself married to my work and while I'm flattered by your no. interest, I'm really not looking for anything. No. It's very clear where the real romance is being set up. And really, that makes sense when you consider that the show has always been about Sherlock and John. Every episode is about their relationship and their adventures. Molly generally only enters into that for a scene or two. She's only in one scene in The Blind Banker. In her scene, Sherlock interrupts her dinner to get her to help him and refuses to take a break from the case. What are you thinking, Hawk or the pasta? Oh, it's you. This is never going to trouble Egon Rene, is it? I'd stick with the pasta. Don't be doing roast pork, not if you're slicing up cadavers. What are you having? Don't eat when I'm working. Digesting slows me down. So you're working here tonight? He compliments her to get her help, but stops smiling as soon as she looks away. Changed your hair. What? It's the style, usually parted in the middle. Yes, well... No, it's good. It um, suits you better this way. She also happens to be wearing stripes. 
On her blog, she says she knew that Sherlock was manipulating her, but that she went along with it anyway. Again, we're being showed that Molly's feelings for Sherlock aren't good for her, and that she feels used by him. She deserves better than this. Unfortunately for her, she ends up typing in Sherlock's name instead of an alias when she's complaining, and that's when Jim Moriarty finds her. He immediately starts flirting with her to get closer to her, and therefore closer to Sherlock. So this is when she enters a relationship that's doomed to fail so that she can try to get over Sherlock. A few scenes later, John returns to Baker Street after his first shift at work and just happens to be wearing a similar striped shirt to the one that Molly was just wearing. Sherlock starts the conversation by saying he'd like a break from the case, a stark contrast to the scene with Molly. I need to get some air. We're going out tonight. Actually, I've uh, got a date. What? While Sherlock sidestepped Molly's invitation to join her for dinner, when John says he has a date, Sherlock makes it very clear that he's interested in John. To where two people who like each other go out and have fun? That's what I was suggesting. Molly went along with Sherlock's wishes even though she knew she was being manipulated, but then went home and jumped at the first opportunity to be in a relationship with someone else. John is doing the same thing. He's felt ignored and used throughout this case, and so is trying to move on with Sarah. It isn't going to work for either of them. When Sherlock sees Molly and Jim together, he instantly picks up on Moriarty's interest in him. Oh, sorry, I didn't- Jim, hi. Uh, come in, come in. He bluntly tells her the truth so that she won't waste her time with someone who doesn't return her feelings. Sherlock. He's not gay. Why do you have to spoil? He's not. With that level of personal grooming? Because he puts a bit of product in his hair. I put product in my hair. Wash your hair, there's a difference. Plus the extremely suggested fact that he just left his number under this dish here, and I'd say you better break it off now and save yourself the pain. Molly doesn't see it that way. Charming, well done. Just saving her time, isn't that kinder? Kind of, no, no. Sherlock Matt wasn't kind. Because of John's advice here that being blunt isn't the best way to handle unrequited feelings, Sherlock changes his tactic from here on out and will be kinder to Molly in the future. Molly's line here about Sherlock spoiling everything is pretty similar to something that John will write when he eventually breaks up with Sarah, that his life with Sherlock isn't compatible with long-term relationships. In A Scandal in Belgravia, while Sherlock again makes it clear that he isn't interested in Molly, the main thing Molly accomplishes in this episode symbolically is mirroring John's pining and jealousy. At the Christmas party, Sherlock doesn't even consider himself a possibility for Molly's romantic interest, despite the fact that it's obvious to everyone else. Either way, Miss Super has love on her mind. In fact, that she's serious about him is clear from the fact she's giving him a gift at all. That always suggests long-term hopes, however forlorn, and that she's seeing him tonight is evident from her makeup and what she's wearing. Obviously trying to compensate for the size of her mouth and breasts. The same way, he doesn't see John's feelings for him, even though other people pick up on it right away. Somebody loves you. Well, if I had to punch that face, I'd avoid your nose and teeth too. You know, my friends are so wrong about you. Hmm? You're a great boyfriend. Okay, that's good. I mean, I always thought I was great. Now, Sherlock Holmes is a very lucky man. He does apologize to her and kisses her cheek because he's grown since the great game and is trying to handle the situation more kindly, like John told him to. I am sorry. Forgive me. Merry Christmas, Molly Hooper. When Sherlock leaves the room, Molly copes with the rejection by drinking. After Battersea, when John tries to talk to Sherlock about his feelings and where they stand and Sherlock ignores him, John likewise turns to alcohol to cope. Once Irene is supposedly found dead, Molly drops all of her Christmas plans to help Sherlock. You need to come in, Molly. That's okay. Everyone else is busy with Christmas. And is wearing a jumper similar to the one that John was wearing at the party. She's obviously upset when Sherlock recognizes Irene by her body. Thank you, Miss Hooper. Who is she? How did Sherlock recognize her from not her face? John also cancels his Christmas plans to help Sherlock. I am really sorry. And is likewise preoccupied with Sherlock's feelings for Irene. 57? Sorry, what? 57 of those texts, the ones I've heard. Do you have a reply? And yet most of the audience feels bad for Molly and thinks John is just being a concerned friend, even when both are demonstrably jealous. What do I say? What do you normally say? You've texted him a lot. Whose phone is it? A woman's. Your girlfriend. You flirted with Sherlock Holmes. She sent this to my address. She loves to play games. She does? So she's alive then. How are we feeling about that? 
It's at this point that I think Molly starts to believe that she really has no chance with Sherlock. And the same applies to John. But John is wrong. Molly doesn't appear at all in The Hound of Baskerville, so let's skip ahead to the Reichenbach Fall. Now that she's accepted that she doesn't have a chance with Sherlock, she can start standing up to him. So when he calls her by the wrong name, she corrects him. Alkaline. Thank you, John. Molly. Yes. Sherlock defaults to calling anyone who's helpful to him John. That says a lot about his feelings. And I think Molly deserves better than a relationship with someone that doesn't get her name right. Molly's actually quite observant and notices that something is wrong with Sherlock. She even picks up on the cause. When he was dying, he was always cheerful. He was lovely, except when he thought no one could see. I saw him once. He looked sad. Molly. You look sad when you think he can't see you. For that reason, I think it's at this point where Molly knows where Sherlock's true interests lie. That's why she's able to speak up more. She knows that she's not the one that Sherlock is interested in. Instead, she offers her help, even if she isn't the one who matters. Are you okay? Don't just say you are, because I know what that means, looking sad when you think no one can see you. You can see me. I don't count. I think Sherlock is both surprised that Molly noticed and that he managed to overlook her and realizes that Moriarty probably overlooked her too. That maybe she could help him, but he doesn't know how yet. I mean, if there's anything you need, it's fine. What, what, what can I need from you? Molly continues to stand up for herself and leaves on her own terms. I don't know. I'd probably say thank you, actually. Thank you. I'm just gonna go and get some crisps. Do you want anything? It's okay. I know you don't. Well, actually, maybe I I'll... know you don't. This scene is particularly great because it's when Molly starts to come to her own as a character. And again, she only does this by putting aside her feelings for Sherlock and standing up to him. It shows again that her feelings for him aren't healthy and are holding her back. Later in the episode, things take a turn for the worse, and Sherlock realizes that Moriarty's plan will probably end with him faking suicide. While I think parts of the Lazarus explanation were embellished a little bit to make Sherlock seem like he was more in control than he was, I think the basic explanation is true. Sherlock realized that the kidnapper must have looked like him, and so he he went to Molly to help him find that body to use as his double. At this point, he knows that he'll most likely have to leave John, and he's upset. He's not okay. You're wrong, you man. You do count. You've always counted, and I've always trusted you. But you were right. I'm not okay. He breaks the mask because he knows Molly has already seen through it. Molly, I think I'm going to die. What do you need? I wasn't everything that you think I am. Everything that I think I am. But you still want to help me. What do you need? You. Sherlock turned to Molly rather than John because he knew that Moriarty wasn't paying attention to her, and because he didn't trust himself to be open with John because that would put him even more at risk. But at the time, which lasted a very long two years of hiatus, a lot of people read this scene romantically. The writers knew that, and they wanted to address it right out of the gate in the new series. So they started the empty hearse with what everyone was waiting for, an explanation of how Sherlock survived, apparently by using a combination of bungee cords, a Sherlock mask, and a hypnotist. John, look at me, look at me, and sleep. This ridiculous scenario caps off with Sherlock crashing through a window and kissing Molly. <laughs> Seconds later, though, No, 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 it's obvious. Sherlali is blatantly dismissed as a fantasy. And there was no John Locke fantasy kiss, despite it having the privilege of being the biggest ship in the fandom. If fan service was their true aim, that would have been the obvious choice. But that's not what they were doing. They were dismissing an inaccurate viewing of the show. When Sherlock returns to London, his primary focus is on seeing John as soon as possible. I need you to give this matter your full attention, Sherlock. Is that quite clear? What do you think of this shirt? And what about John Watson? John? Hmm. Have you seen him? Oh, yes. We meet up every Friday for fish and chips. 
I've kept a weather eye on him, of course. It's only after things don't go as planned with John. Are you really going to keep that? That Sherlock announces to everyone else, including Molly, that he's back. <sighs> the next day, Sherlock feels lonely and calls Molly. Since Molly helped him survive the fall off the roof, and John clearly isn't interested in working with him anymore, Sherlock decides to try working with her instead. Molly still hasn't fully moved past her feelings and can't stop herself from hoping that Sherlock asking to see her is romantically driven, even now that she's in a relationship with someone else. You wanted to see me? Yes. Molly. Yes. Would you... Would you like to Have solve dinner. crimes? If this relationship were ever going to work, now would be the time to show that. It starts off well enough. Sherlock even reassures Molly that he doesn't want her to be John, just herself. Are you sure about this? Absolutely. Should I be making notes? If it makes you feel better. And it's just that that's what John says he does, so if I'm being John... being John, you're being yourself. Well, absolutely. Despite that, though, Molly still tries to fill John's role by taking notes, probably still instinctively feeling like that's what Sherlock wants. You're onto something, aren't you? And when they go to solve the case that Anderson set up, Sherlock is hearing John's voice in his head. Maybe. Shut up. Shut up, John. What? Hmm? Nothing. <laughs> now, please insult away. Forgive me. You can't. When they leave that crime scene, he defaults back to calling her John. Why would someone go to all that trouble? Why indeed, John? It's not working out. And all the while, these scenes are juxtaposed with John working at the clinic, where things are likewise not working out. This is Mr. Blake. Piles. <laughs> Mr. Blake, hi. Sounds a bit dry, I know. But there's a nun with all these holes and her habits. Jesus. Sherlock. What? What do you want? Huh? Have you come to torment me? <laughs> not as good as your French. It's not even a good disguise, Sherlock. Oh. Where'd you get it from? A bloody oh. joke shop? <sighs> oh, my God. I... I am so sorry. Oh, my God. Please. It's fine. John and Sherlock can't be happy or fulfilled without each other. Molly doesn't enter into that. She knows that, so she asks Sherlock why he asked her to come with him. Sherlock? Mm. What was today about? Saying thank you. For what? Everything you did for me. It's okay. It's my pleasure. No. I mean it. I don't mean pleasure. I mean I didn't mind. I wanted to. Moriarty slipped up. He made a mistake. It was the one person he thought didn't matter at all to me it was the one person that mattered the most. You made it all possible. In context, she matters because everyone underestimated her. That doesn't mean a relationship between them is looming. The rest of the conversation makes that much clearer. But you can't do this again, can you? I had a lovely day. I'd love to, I just... Um... And congratulations, by the way. He's not from work. We met three friends, old fashioned way. He's nice, we, he's got a dog, we, we go to the pub on weekends and he, I've met his mum and dad and his friends and all his family, I've no idea what I'm... Molly can't keep doing this because she's engaged to someone else and she's trying to be committed to them, but she clearly still isn't over Sherlock. That sounds really familiar. It must have something to do with the fact that John also got engaged in this episode and couldn't go back to being with Sherlock because he was focusing on his life with Mary and trying to make that work out. Hey, wait a minute! Anyway, Sherlock wishes Molly well and tells her that not everyone she falls for will be unfeeling towards her and kisses her on the cheek before leaving. Again, still trying to be kind about Molly's obvious feelings. I hope you'll be very happy, Molly Hooper. You deserve it. After all, not all the men you fall for can turn out to be sociopaths. No. After he's left, she says that's just her type. Maybe it's just my type. That comes back later. Even ending on a good note, the two characters go their separate ways, and they won't be working together again. Later, after Sherlock saves John from the bonfire, John goes back to Baker Street and Sherlock points out his recently shaved mustache. This is where the same lines start being used by both John and Molly. So you shaved it off then? Yeah. 
wasn't working for me. Yeah, I'm glad. Well, you didn't like it? I prefer my doctor's clean shaven. What happened to the lipstick? It wasn't working for me. Really? I thought it was a big improvement. Mouth's too small now. Both changed their appearance based on Sherlock's response to it, and Sherlock's response to John changing his appearance is much more positive. Molly comes back at the end of the episode, and we get to see her fiancé. It's really nice to meet you all. Hi. Wow, yeah, hi, I'm John. Good to meet you. Ready? Ready. Champagne? That's familiar. I'll do anything for you. Just tell me what it is I'm not doing. Tell me. Don't make me compete with Sherlock Holmes. Lestrade asks about Molly's relationship, and Molly says she's totally moved on, which again should sound familiar. Is it serious, you see? Yeah. We've moved on. Is it serious? What? No. No, I'm, I'm not ill. I've, uh, well, I'm moving on. Lestrade understandably looks skeptical. He's not the only one. John obviously suspects what's happening, but Sherlock plans on not saying anything about it, the same way he's decided to not point out any of the problems in John's relationship with Mary, which is why he ignores the warning signs for so long. When did you uh... Not best enough. At the wedding, Molly is being very publicly affectionate with her fiancé, which mirrors the entire premise of this entire episode supposedly being a celebration of John and Mary's love. <laughs> We see in flashbacks, though, that Molly has been preoccupied with how Sherlock will handle the wedding. What if John asks Sherlock to be his best man? Well, he will, and he's bad. Exactly. So? So he'll have to make a speech in front of people. There'll be actual people there actually listening. I was just thinking, if, if John does ask Sherlock, what, the speech, dear? I know, it'll be fine. It's not just the speech, though, is it? Because going back to the Reichenbach Fall, she knows the person Sherlock most hides his feelings from is John, and she knows why, especially after this speech. So I know this. Today you sit between the woman you have made your wife and the man you have saved. In short, the two people who love you most in all this world. And I know I speak for Mary as well when I say we will never let you down and we have a lifetime ahead to prove that. She's sitting there next to the person she chose to help her get over Sherlock, and so is John. Both are moved to tears at the obvious love in Sherlock's words, though John understandably feels more regret than Molly does. If I try and hug him, stop me. Certainly not. A bit later on, Molly is embarrassed at Tom's attempt to be clever and basically tells him to shut up, hinting that the relationship isn't going as well as she tries to make it seem. Attempted suicide with a blade made of compacted blood and bone. Broke after piercing his abdomen like a meat dagger. A meat dagger? Yes. Sit down. Pissed, isn't he? Before the stag night, Sherlock goes to Molly to get some help with the chemistry. Sherlock's idea for a perfect night out involves just him and John going to get drinks on every street where they found a corpse, which is, like, ridiculously romantic in the most morbid way possible. Rainbows pass over the screen as Sherlock explains his plan. Murder scenes. Locations of murders. Mmm, pub crawl themed. Yeah, but why, why can't you just do underground stations? It lacks the personal touch. We're going to go for a drink in every, every street, street where, where we found a corpse. Delightful. Molly isn't working with Sherlock the same way she used to since she's still trying to move on. She talks back. Why do I come in? Don't want to get ill. That would ruin it, spoil the mood. You're a graduate chemist. Can't you just work it out? I like the practical experience. Meaning you think I like a drink? Occasionally. That I am a drunk. No, no. Molly's line about drinking ties back to the fact that we've seen both Molly and John drinking to cope with being rejected by Sherlock. It's just another way the two characters are tied together. Unlike how upset Sherlock looks whenever someone mentions John's wedding. I warned you, don't get involved. Involved, I'm not involved. No. John asked me to be his best man, how could I say no? Absolutely. Not involved. I believe you, really, I do. Sherlock just looks weirded out at the image of Molly having quite a lot of sex, not heartbroken. Not a sociopath. Still good. And we're having quite a lot of sex. Okay. He quickly changes the topic to discussing his ideal man instead. Light-headed. Good. Urinating in wardrobes, bad. She knows. That night, Sherlock deduces that Mary is pregnant and becomes even more upset than he's been throughout the episode. He puts on a happy face while John is looking. You know, Baker Street behind closed curtains. Mrs. Hudson came in one time. Don't know how those rumors started. <laughs> <laughs>
but as soon as he's gone, he looks sad. As usual, Molly notices, but this time she doesn't offer help, because like John, she's trying to be happy in the choices that she's made. It isn't going to last for either of them. Not even a month later, it's obvious that John isn't happy with his choices. Seen a lot of injuries then. Violent deaths. Enough for a lifetime. Want to see some more? Oh God, yes. The game is on. He's lashing out at everyone. Is the drugs one yet? Yeah? <laughs> uh, yeah, nicely put, John. <laughs> But is it Sherlock Holmes you want? Because I've not seen him in ages. About a month. Who is Sherlock Holmes? See? That does happen. What's the matter with you? There is nothing the matter with me. Imagine I said that without shouting. I'm trying. And decides to storm a drug den so he can try to feel alive for a few seconds. Go. Or I'll cut ya. Oh, not from there. Let me help. Now, concentrate. Isaac Whitney. OK, you are for it. While he's there, he finds what he's really missing. Not the adrenaline, but Sherlock. Come for me too. John is outraged to find him there and drags him to the hospital to see if he's taken drugs. We're not going home, we're going to Bart's and calling Molly. Why? Because Sherlock Holmes needs to pee in a jar. Molly is the one to run the tests and is likewise infuriated at the results. Well, is he clean? Clean. She specifically hits him three times. It's just the two of us against the rest of the world. Molly yells at Sherlock, and Sherlock tries to turn the conversation back on her failed relationship, so she tells him to stop. How dare you throw away the beautiful gifts you were born with? And how dare you betray the love of your friends? Say you're sorry. Sorry your engagement's over. I'm fairly grateful for the lack of a ring. Stop it. Just stop it. John then walks over, and the same conversation plays out with him. He yells at Sherlock. Sherlock turns the attention back to John biking to work, rather than simply riding in the car with his wife since they both work at the same place, and John refuses to go there. Stop it. If you were anywhere near this kind of thing again, you could have called, you could have talked to me. Oh, please do relax. This is all for a case. What kind of case would need you doing this? I might as well ask you why you started cycling to work. No, we're not playing this game. Quite recently, I'd say you're very determined about it. Not interested. Sherlock leaves the lab without setting things right with Molly, and we'll see this continuing to bother him in the next episode. When John is leaving Baker Street later on, we get the reuse of another line to draw a parallel between John and Molly. You're just assuming I'm coming along. So have you got out of the house, John? You've gone on seven pounds since you got married and the cycling isn't doing it. It's actually four pounds. Baron, I think seven. See you later. And domestic dress must suit you, Molly. You've gone on three pounds since I last saw you. Two and a half. Mm, three. It's interesting to note that at the time Sherlock said this to Molly, she was dating Moriarty. What is that saying about Mary? Nothing good. Speaking of Mary, later in the episode, she shoots Sherlock. Sherlock is working very hard on not dying, and he uses people he knows to represent different parts of his brain. He uses Molly for medical expertise. It's not like it is in the movies. There's not a great big spurt of blood and you go flying backwards. The impact isn't spread over a wide area. It's tightly focused, so there's little or no energy transfer. You stay still, and the bullet pushes through. And like everyone else in his brain, Molly is being mean to him. I said, focus. It's all well and clever having a mind palace, but you've only three seconds of consciousness left to use it. Which says a lot about his mental state at the minute. Mind Palace Molly makes it clear more than once that if Sherlock doesn't get this right, Mary will have killed him. You're almost certainly going to die, so we need to focus. So come on, what's going to kill you? You're going into shock. It's the next thing that's going to kill you. Mary is clearly dangerous, and Sherlock sets up a situation which will allow John to see that firsthand. You are very slow. How good a shot are you? How badly do you want to find out? Sorry. Not that obvious a trick. <laughs> when
when they go back to Baker Street, John demands to know how this happened. And this, to me, is the most heartbreaking exchange in the series. John, you are addicted to a certain lifestyle. You're abnormally attracted to dangerous situations and people, so is it truly such a surprise that the woman you fall in love with conforms to that pattern? But she wasn't supposed to be like that. Why is she like that? Because you chose her. I'm including this here because it ties back to Sherlock and Molly's conversation about Molly's type in The Empty Hearse. Sherlock isn't genuinely a sociopath, but Molly has the tendency to be attracted to men who aren't genuinely interested in her. She accepts this, maybe because it feels safer to her. John likewise accepts that he's attracted to dangerous people, like Sherlock and Sholto, but insistently asks why Mary is like that. Because the whole point of choosing Mary was choosing someone safe, who wouldn't hurt him the way he thinks Sherlock would. Molly moves on to someone who seems like Sherlock, while John tries to move on by finding the opposite of Sherlock. Both end up being disappointed with their substitute. We only see real Molly two more times. Once when she says she readily gives up her bedroom for Sherlock whenever he needs it. She's still not in a healthy place. Just this bad bedroom. Well, my bedroom. We agreed he needs the space. The other is when she's reacting to seeing Moriarty on TV. The main thing to keep in mind when trying to understand anything in The Abominable Bride is that almost everything in the episode happens in Sherlock's head, and so reflects more on how he sees things rather than how they actually are. This includes how Molly acts towards him. On the surface, Molly is dressed as a man because she would have to in order to be able to do her job in the Victorian era. On a deeper level, it might be reflecting how Sherlock feels like he has to present a certain way in order to do his work. Molly is still rather harsh with Sherlock in his mind. He probably feels like he still hasn't made things right with her. Holmes. Rupert. You, back to work. So, come to astonish us with your magic tricks, I suppose. Is there anything to which you would like to draw my attention? Nothing at all, Mr. Holmes. You may leave anytime you like. It might also be that Sherlock finds it easier to deal with a Molly who hates him, rather than trying to deal with Molly's feelings for him when he doesn't return them. He feels like he's failed her in that regard. But considering how she pointed out Sherlock's feelings for John in the Reichenbach Fall, it makes sense she's the first to call out Sherlock on his feature of interest. There are two features of interest, as you are always saying in Dr. Watson's stories. I never say that. Well, you do. Actually, quite a lot. There was one feature, and only one feature, of interest in the whole of this baffling case, and quite frankly, it was the usual. John Watson. Sherlock's imagination also plays up the rivalry between John and Molly. Oh, isn't he observant now that Daddy's gone? I am observant in some ways, just as Holmes is quite blind in others. Really? Yes. Really? Amazing. What one has to do to get ahead in a man's world. John is clearly the winner in this exchange, just as he'll be the one to end up with Sherlock. Molly turns up for the last time in The Secret Society. I'll be making a video dedicated to the symbolism of the League of Furies later on, so I'm not focusing on that aspect now. I'll focus on Molly herself. She appears as one of the two women that Sherlock feels that he's let down by not returning their interest. Molly talks about Amelia Recoletti being left abandoned, and Sherlock remembers Molly's anger with him in his last vow. He knew her out in the States. Promised her everything. Marriage, position. And then he had his way with her and threw her over, left her abandoned and penniless. Cooper. Thanks. Again, this shows that Sherlock feels like he has failed Molly in handling her attraction to him, especially in his last vow when he was cruel about her failed engagement. When Sherlock talks about ignoring and disparaging women, he flashes back to Molly haunting John, the reason he's ignored her. The women we have ignored and disparaged. <laughs> 
because that's been the point all along. Sherlock can't return Molly's feelings because he's gay and in love with someone else. This scene is Sherlock coming to terms with that and internally making amends. We'll see in the next series how this affects the way he treats her. But regardless of his future actions, I think it's clear that at this point, both characters know that in order for Molly to be happy, she has to move on from Sherlock. While my focus in this series is on TGLC, and I've talked a lot about how Molly supports that, I think what they've done with Molly herself as a character is really interesting. Having a character like Molly starting off as shy and in love with the male lead, and having her grow as a person over the course of the series, not to be worthy of the man's love, but to find confidence in herself and the ability to move on from someone who can't return her feelings, is really subversive and powerful. Whether she ends up finding happiness in a relationship with someone like Greg Lestrade, or ends finding fulfillment in her work and her friends, I think the Molly we'll see at the end of the series will be brave and sure of herself. And I think she deserves that ending. Well, that's a wrap on the Molly video. Thank you so much for watching. This week I consulted two creator interviews when writing this script. I also first came across the idea of Molly as a mirror for John in a meta by Fox Julaby, which you should definitely check out. I have a schedule ready for you all for the next few months, and it goes as follows. Next week I'll be talking about The Hound of Baskerville. May 22nd I'll be discussing minor mirrors in series 1 and 2. May 29th I'll be talking about John's bisexuality. June 5th I'll be making a collab video on how Oscar Wilde's trial parallels the events of the Reichenbach fall. June 12th I'll be talking about the Reichenbach fall itself. June 19th is minor mirrors in series 3 and The Abominable Bride. And June 26th I'll be talking about Sherlock's gay coding. I actually have the rest of the hiatus planned out, but I want to leave some room for surprise, so I hope you're looking forward to all of those. I'll be back soon for The Hound of Baskerville, and until then, get ready to believe.